Yeah, well, what we've got here is sort of the, all in one corner, sort of the typical construction of the whole building, don't we? We've got the the granite stone with the you know the lines carved onto the uh, the mortar joints, and you've got the original orangey colored bricks serving as as coins where they project in and around the uh, the walls, and they're also they use these at the corners and uh, and around the windows and doors. I think this is an architect design building. Uh, it'll be hard to prove, but it, it has that feel to it. Well, as, as far as I know, the house was built in 1894 by Dr. Bush, and he came here in about 1880. He was a medical doctor, originally with the British uh, Expeditionary Forces, and uh, he had been in the Zulu Wars and mm -hmm. in India and so on. Right. Uh, he built Kilfane, which was a big framed house about uh, eight miles south of town. And they farmed the gentleman farmer life. There wasn't a school for a long time. This was why the Bushes had hired a governess, which was my grandmother, to come and uh, teach their children out on the farm. In Grand Fowl, there was a lot of um, moneyed Englishman came to this area. He was related to the English royalty. Uh -huh. Well, to come out here in the 1890s and to buy six quarter sections and then to build a, a, a farm that was <laughs> yeah. an estate in all intents and purposes, yeah. and then to turn around and build an extra house in town, yeah. had to have some, uh, some considerable well, I, money. I think what they did was basically they probably went broke farming. <laughs> was was well, not the first one, <laughs> they? No, no. And it won't be but, the last. But the style in which they did it did not uh, lend itself to making any money, I don't no. think. So then he built the house in town here, I guess, to get the kids closer to school. And I think he was going back, going to do uh, his medical practice, uh, do more of that. Uh, unfortunately, he died in 1898. There was an interesting anecdote about uh, his, his demise because he had written an article for a newspaper in Ontario stating that this is such a wonderful climate and nobody gets pneumonia. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, after it's published, he dies of pneumonia. They had, uh, I think, six children. Five, 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 five or six. Five or That's six right. children. And uh, they were still quite young, most of the family. Right. In fact, I think the youngest was born just a few months before he died. Not long before. Yeah. That's right. And then uh, his wife, uh, she would have, uh, well, she owned the farm and she owned the house, which was nice, but I guess there wasn't a lot of cash in the bank. By then they were pretty well broke. She had next to nothing. Uh, she, um, her friends sort of rallied around and, and helped her out. And uh, I think they got her a smaller house. And then the house went through a number of owners. Uh, at one point it was sort of a boarding house for the upper crust, the, be the better, you know, the bank tellers and school teachers and so on. A district office for the health district was in town. I was commuting from Regina and I, it just got to be too much, uh, just too much of a drive. So started looking around for something and this is where Certainly my interest and Eva's to a certain degree were in older houses and so on and, and uh, I drove by this place several times. There's a big row of caragamas in front of it. I never realized it was here. And then along the way somewhere they, I spotted it as I was going by and I kind of fell in love with it. <laughs> Amongst our family and friends, <laughs> it's known as Alvin's dream and Eva's nightmare. <laughs> I was pushing not to buy it. I kept saying, Alvin, well, it needs this and it needs that. And, and he kept saying to me, oh, Eva, it'll be okay. You won't have to do any work. And, and uh, you know, I'll look after it all. <laughs> it didn't turn out that way. Oh. You, Flashlight, uh, you, that's good. Yeah, I could use that? one of those. Yeah, I'd like to look around. <laughs> yeah. Joists are uh, big, full, full dimension, you know, yeah. two by 12s? Yeah, uh, two by 10s. Two, or two by 10s, okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, closely spaced, so they'll hold this building for a long time. Is this a solid beam? Yep. Yeah, yeah the main beam's six, solid. Six, six by 12, yeah. Wow. 
Now, there's a, a brick arch over there, I see. Where did that lead? Was uh, there, a... there was a coal bin. Oh, oh the coal bin mm -hmm. was in there. was back in there. Right. So I'm noticing the stone wall, we've still got stone on uh, the two sides. Yeah, and it was originally stone on four sides. Right. Right. Okay, I just want to take a quick look at the wall here in case there's anything that, that we may have missed. Yeah, just definitely the mortar is leaching out quite badly, isn't it? Oh, it's leached right through in yeah. lots of places, yeah. Now that's it, yeah, it just, it just crumbles totally. Yeah. So the best you can do here is rake out the joints and then uh, reparge them. Well, what I do is I wash them out with a uh, pressure washer. Oh, okay. Well, that'll clean them out good. And then redo them with Portland cement, no lime in the right. mortar. And that's uh, resistant to that alkali. The alkali attacking your brick as well? Like, is it doesn't powderizing seem, the brick? No, it doesn't seem to be. Oh, that's good. We get some latents on the brick when, right. when there's a little moisture around, but nothing to speak nothing of. Nothing serious. Oh, that's good, because yeah. you do have a lot of brick here, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I see a couple of bricks out there. I'm going to have to check the bricks out. Yeah. I always like to... <laughs> Part of my research with... Uh, Construction is to work on bricks that have, uh, you know, been used or manufactured in Western Canada. This is a, uh, this buff, buff colored one. This may yeah. have been made locally. Uh, it was made by uh, Mr. Switzer. They had a kiln just back of the house here. Right. Somewhere. You can see uh, the red brick it comes from the Alberta Clay Products Company. Yeah. It's got ACP Co. in the, in the frog. Yeah. Um, that probably, well, that could have been used, uh, it was a later brick, probably ma manufactured in the early 20th century, so it wouldn't be original to that, the, uh, that's what I to the house. Too. Yeah. Do you have any red bricks like this, uh, being used in, inside the house anywhere? You know, th these bricks, they're, they're probably made in the 19, early teens or 20s, and, uh, judging by the rough texture on them, it's, it's a rather crude looking brick, but that was popular, especially in the 20s, when, uh, People wanted to get away from the, the tradition of very smooth bricks, and so rough textures became popular, and it was called art brick. Now, Richard Talnay was the, uh, the stonemason who, as far as we're aware, built this house. He was, a, uh, he was an English stonemason and a bricklayer. He, he had both trades, oh, yeah. as often they did. And he built a number of uh, buildings in the, uh, along the main line of the, the CPR. He actually homesteaded uh, near Wapella. Oh, is that right? Between Wapella and uh, Rokenville. Well, that explains... Close to the valley. Yeah, that explains some of the buildings up there then. Uh, he seems to build most of his buildings here in Grenfell. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, the bank, uh, some stores, the town office, uh, the, the old town office were all built by him. And his sons, he had two sons that helped him out. I, I find the fellow interesting uh, because uh, he's born in 1843 in England, gets married in 1872, and his, he and his wife take off to Chile. <laughs> where uh, at Valparaiso, they're helping the, the government build a series of boat docks. Oh, for heaven's sake. And then in 1883, uh, he moves to Winnipeg and is there for a while. And it isn't until 1890 that he comes to Saskatchewan and he, he takes out this homestead. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, you know, like, I guess farming then is like farming now. Yeah. He needs an <laughs> off-farm income. Yeah. And so his off-farm income was building, uh, building houses and churches and schools and business blocks. And, oh, isn't uh, that wonderful? I think a house like that would probably take four to five you know, years to build um, because of the short building seasons and probably the, you know, the limited masons available to work on it. I mean, there's stone piles around here, right? You know, in Europe they would have built walls. Here we just made piles. Um, so you have a big resource of field stone readily available. So you'd go out to the stone pile and, uh, and really with a, with a hammer, once you've split a couple hundred of them, you have an idea of where to hit them, and they'll split quite, you know, fairly easily. Um, and then you can go about pitching them uh, into more regular, workable shapes. Pitching would be you, you split, a, let's say you split a round stone, and you're left with two, you know, flat, round surfaces with a flat pitching tool. Um, I can get one if you like. Uh, you'd uh, trace a line. You know, draw with pencil or, or charcoal the line you want to cut square and you just pitch back with a flat chisel and it'll cleave off on that line until you have a, you know, a fairly square shape that'll be left in the face of the wall. Your corners are what takes the time when you're building a, uh, something out of a stone. 
Um, you know, stone making a stone corner probably takes two to three times as long as just putting it flat in the building. Doing brick in the corner uh, can save time and cost, therefore. Yeah. And it's architecturally appealing to the mix of the two materials. Now, it's not a solid wall in most cases. It's two walls, isn't it's it? It's two walls, yeah. So there's an outer wall and an inner wall and then a cavity in between? or uh, Well, a cavity and rubble. And rubble. Anything that broke up that he couldn't use, yeah, he would he throw in a cavity. In there. The type of building technique where there's, it's called double skinned, where there's two stone walls and you have an airspace in between was, I guess, at the time, you know, in the early 1900s would have been pretty high tech or, you know, labor intensive. Um, what it did is it added an insulated value between the two walls, but it takes twice as long to do, essentially. It was sagged on the back about six or seven inches in one corner and so I brought in a mud uh, jackers and it was an adventure to get the big place to move because you think of two foot thick walls roughly 18 feet high and the size that this house is uh, there's a tremendous amount of weight there. I didn't think for a while that he was going to get it to move at all we ended up uh, pumping, I think it was 50 plus cubic yards of material below there to, to stabilize it. And we put that in all the way around the house because we wanted to tighten everything up and make sure it wasn't going to move too much again. Uh, but then we had all that material to bring out of the basement. And my son-in-law mainly, and with my help at times, we carried that all out of there in five gallon buckets up a rickety old flight of steps and, and uh, dumped it in a cistern out here that we were going to backfill anyways. Well, one of the things we noticed when we, we started repairing the house was that this style of architecture has some structural weaknesses in it. And, and they're right here where you have a window above a window or a window above a door. And uh, so with any movement of the house, that's where the cracking occurs. It's on the weak spot. And it tends to be that way because the walls are a lot heavier uh, at the ends of a wall because you've got the side walls and not as heavy in the center. So any settlement occurs on the outside and it opens up the, the house a little bit. So you can see a difference in the mortar color here and down here. And that's where we've repointed uh, blocks and closed up all the cracks. The cracks are the hard ones to get and, and keep sealed up because these old houses still move a little bit and, and stone doesn't, so when it moves, something gives a little bit. Some of the regrouting that I did has got little cracks in it. And it's just life in a stone house. <laughs> well, we're standing in my den. Uh, this was originally a bedroom, uh, and there was a wall across about where we're standing. The grandkids love it. They come up and sit in the windows and read books and do all sorts of things. They, they love this space. They all fight to sleep yep. in this room rather than a bedroom. This room is built right over top the front entryway and the front entryway has no heat in it. And uh, this was the first place we had a bed when we first come out here. And uh, the first night that Alvin set the bed up in here, <laughs> he, he had to put his uh, ski pants on and mm. there was so much wind blowing up from the entryway through that, the floor, uh, through the, the cracks bed, in the floor, that uh, you froze, you mm. absolutely froze in here. <laughs> it was cold. That's, so, what, that's when we moved into the bathroom. <laughs> there had been a bathroom redone uh, before we bought the house and it was a fairly good sized room and uh, we put our bed in there eventually and uh, that's where we lived was basically in the bathroom for uh, several years <laughs> i think this has probably been the bathroom since they put plumbing in the house uh, previously it was the maid's room as far as we know i used to joke about us living on the east wing because that's the bathroom and the kitchen and it was so cold that we would have to come down, make our meal with our winter coats on, and then go up and sit in the bathroom and eat, the, eat our supper. We had a bed right there, and a wardrobe right there, and uh, 
you could wake up in the morning, turn on the shower, and then get out of bed. <laughs> this is the master bedroom now. Uh, originally, when the house was built, it was two bedrooms, and there was a wall across just about where we're standing, across the room, and there was a doorway out behind uh, here, out into the hallway. And uh, when we bought the house, that wall had been taken down. The molding around the light fixture is uh, is one that we made again. It's uh, one it's of five. One of five that we made yeah. made with a mold that we made, and then we pulled five plaster uh, medallions from it. This is our our guest room. We call it the cherub room. Well, I was waiting for Alvin to get his work done, and <laughs> waiting and waiting and waiting. So I finally bought two of the little cherubs and uh, I made a mold and I cast the rest and I forget there's about 160 or 180 of them up there I think and and uh, then I glued them up and uh, when I finished they didn't really show up they just looked like little blobs so then I got up and painted all of them. Well originally there would have been six bedrooms here there was the two along this side there's one at the end of the hallway that we took out and then two on the other side is five, and then the maid's room, which would have been a bedroom, bathroom now, uh, was six. So, and people slept more than one to a bed, the kids did. So, six children, that's just two beds. This is the smallest bedroom that we have, uh, and... It, it, it turned out to be my sewing room, and... Uh, it's usually very messy. We did clean before you came. <laughs> <laughs> the archway here was original to the house. When we stripped everything out, we just took the, the plaster and lath off it and we redid it. Originally, I suspect that there was a, a rod across here and a curtain that hung down here and the stairs were, went down right here. So this would have been the maid's part of the house, her room, the stairway, and this little piece and this side was the family and uh, that would allow her to be do her job and not intrude upon the family at any time. The stairway here, Eva stripped it all in place. 67 spindles. And every one of them a pain in the neck. And glued on uh, carpet all the way down. Yes. Too. <laughs> rubber back glued on carpet that we had to scrape with sand. No, Eva had to scrape and sand. <laughs> Mainly I get all the dirty jobs, but uh, like stripping all the old paint off, it took me hours and weeks and months to, I think I was four months doing the windows upstairs outside and uh, pretty well all the um, woodwork in the house has all been stripped down, cleaned off, done something with it and I'm glad we did it. It it looks a lot better for it. Well our son-in-law decided I should be known as the Grenfell stripper <laughs> and so he made me some uh, business cards. <laughs> this post uh, here was all enclosed, boxed in and the railing was cut off and uh, the the ball on the top here was cut off and I think it was part of their attempt to make the styling a little bit more like a, a arts and crafts and uh, so I got a block of wood and I turned a new knob for it the same as the other noodle posts and put it back together again and Eva worked her magic with the with the stain and and the refinishing and you'd be hard-pressed to tell that it had ever been apart really so it's uh, one of the showpieces of the home. This house really decorates great for Christmas. Uh, we have uh, stockings that we hang all the way up uh, for each one of the kids and their spouses and, and grandkids and, and uh, it, it looks spectacular actually. We fill kids. every step from the bottom to the top now. <laughs> <laughs> we had to take a stairwell out uh, to make better use of the space. The stairs used to start about the middle of this window and they went up here to a landing and then turned and went upstairs, the back of the maid's staircase. And that window was actually into the staircase and the staircase was very narrow and steep. And uh, there was only about 
five or six feet of cupboards in here. You couldn't put a table or anything in here to roll pie pastry or do any of that uh, yep. prep work on. So I, I really have no idea how they how they would have functioned in yeah. in the space, but it was a, a pathetic yeah. kitchen. But you know, there was also the summer kitchen, and there was a little bit of a pantry. Yeah, you have more winter than summer in this kitchen. <laughs> Originally, there was a, an inside flue uh, right up through the middle of this stone wall, and then later on, they built an outside chimney, which was about here, uh, all the way up and through the, the soffit on the top. And, uh, and they hooked into it from the kitchen with the range, and then there was a summer kitchen out here, and they moved the range out here, and they hooked into it uh, in the summer kitchen. I hooked onto the top of it with a hook in my truck, and, Pulled it over, took it down. There was originally a small parlor here that had a wall along here and back uh, just behind us. Uh, that was gone when we bought the house and instead there was a library wall that came across here with double bookshelves on either side and then columns. But it wasn't a look that we liked and uh, we wanted to get back more to the old uh, what it might have been in 1895. The moldings are the same as the ones in the dining room. Alvin had great expectations of making them different for each room and uh, and making and doing moldings for upstairs also. But uh, <laughs> I soon, <laughs> soon talked him out of that. <laughs> Reality set in, yeah. I think we've pulled something like 30 two odd, of them I think 32, 32 uh, yeah. six foot pieces of molding out of our apparatus we had set up and then you've got to fix all the joints because they don't fit exactly and so you've got to fiddle all those things and that means filling them and then scraping them with basically with dental tools and doing the corners and doing the carving on the plaster there and, it took a long time. And I was afraid they were going to all fall down. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> when we bought the house, the dining room was really the, the other end of the room. The Maliva was convinced that the other would be a better dining room. And that's one of the things we wanted, was a good big dining room. Using this room as a dining room worked out very well for us because there's so many uh, doorways and windows and it's hard to place furniture. I, we're, we're really happy with what we ended up in, with in here. One of the things I love about this house is that we can have a fairly large groups of people in. Alvin used to work for the Wheat Pool and we still have a group that we uh, keep in touch with and we try and get together twice a year anyway and uh, they love coming out here. Well, the French doors here were, uh, had been cut off because the house had settled so much and they would cut the doors off on the top and the bottom so that doors would close and open. It required a, a tremendous amount of work to save them, really. And we cut them off square and then we added material onto them in a solid piece to, to uh, build them back up to the right length. I managed to get some old glass which is rippled, uh, same as what was in them originally. Like so many things in an old house, uh, it takes an awful lot of work to bring them back, but once they're back, they're actually quite durable. And when you stripped down all the plaster lath off the walls, did you find any uh, newspapers or tools or any writing on any of we, the... We found a few bottles uh, in the basement and we found, uh, I think it was a kid's treasure warehouse, storehouse mm -hmm. in the corner of the kitchen where there'd been a fire it looked like and it had burnt off the end of some boards and there was a bunch of stuff tucked in there. I've got some prescription That's bottles that go back to the 1890s. From uh, this house? Yeah, from this house. Oh. Uh, see, Dr. Bush was a medical doctor. Right. 
Is his name on the label? Yeah, or? and and the pharmacy and the pharmacy that, that was in town here. Yeah, and uh, so there's there's a few things like that. I want to do up a display area with everything that we found in the house. And we that's, just that's a have, good idea. Yeah, so you've have, kept all these items. Oh yes, good. Oh yes, yeah. they're all tucked away carefully. Yeah, because they are part of the history. This was originally uh, an open veranda. Uh, so where all the windows and the doors are now, it was just open spaces. We rebuilt the veranda, uh, took out all the rotted wood that was in it, and closed it in with windows and doors and so on, and opened this up to use it for what it really can be, which is a really nice place to have a lunch or a breakfast. And, and you're looking east out at our flower gardens at the back, or and you're cut off from the neighborhood with shrubbery and so on. So it's a really nice private spot. You can see out the front to our flower beds in the front. They referred to it as Bushy Park when it was being built. Well, as far as we know, the property on either side of us was once part of this property. And we had thought when we bought, well, wouldn't it be nice to have all of that? But I'll tell you now, this is big enough. <laughs> And I think at one time it went down behind us, the full block, I, I believe. But well, I think you're using the house well. You know, you've taken a, a basically a late 19th century house and brought it into the 21st century yeah. and showing how uh, an old building is, remains functional if you maintain it. Yeah. And that's, that's the trick. If you just abandon it, yes, of course it will deteriorate yeah. and fall down. But well, if I, you maintain it, it's usable forever. Well, I get upset with people who say, you know, you, everything should be as it was originally built. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think so. Not if it creates a, a situation where it's not a usable building That's anymore. Right. If you can't heat it, uh, well, forget it. it yeah, it's just in this gonna, climate. It's just going to fall into the ground. Sure. And yeah. uh, so I think you have to do things with some sensitivity to what used mm -hmm. to be there and try and maintain the appearance and everything yeah. that you can. Grenfell has been really great for us. I am not the least bit sorry that we have moved here and uh, we've met some really nice people. It's a friendly town. It's a, it's a great place to, to live. I really like the house now. I, I like the, just about everything about it, I think, now. I just, the only thing I'd really like now is for it to be done. <laughs> <laughs>